Okay. So um, these are just solubility rules. Remember, you have to memorize these solubility rules. You have to know them. Um, and so make sure you know these. And so what they mean is that ions that have um, these or compounds that have these ions in it are mostly soluble, right? Except with these exceptions. So chloride or halides, chlorine, bromine, iodine, they're um, mostly soluble unless they're bonded to silver letter mercury. Okay, then they're insoluble. Whereas over here, ions that form an insoluble compound, so meaning that these ions, um, if they're present, that means they're going to be insoluble unless they're paired with this. Now remember, group one elements, or sorry, group one ions, always soluble, the end, okay? It's got lithium, it's, if it's got sodium, if it's got potassium, it's always gonna be soluble. Um, ammonium and nitrate, ammonium nitrate acetate and hydrogen carbonate are also always soluble. Now remember, hydrogen carbonate is also called bicarbonate, so you'll see them um, interchangeable. So these, there are no exceptions to these. If you have one of these ions present, it's just gonna be soluble. It doesn't matter what it's bonded to, okay? So um, just make sure you know those, um, Solubility rules. Now, predicting those reactions, remember that we switch. So, um, when predicting these, if we have potassium iodide and lead nitrate, we're going to switch them um, to where we make potassium nitrate and lead iodide. And then, once you switch them, you have to determine if it's soluble or not. So, use those solubility rules. Here, I see potassium and nitrate. Both of those have no exceptions. It's aqueous. Whereas lead iodide, well, iodide is usually soluble, but if you'll look back, you'll see that lead is one of those exceptions to where it's insoluble. So lead, sol lead iodide is insoluble, which means that a reaction occurred here, okay? A solid was formed. If both of these were soluble, no reaction. Okay, that just means, remember, that just means all these ions are just floating around in water. It's not doing anything, it's not forming anything. Um, okay, and remember net and complete ionic equations so here we have um, our actual equation, and in net and complete ionic equations, we separate them out into their ions if they're only if they're aqueous, right? So if they're solid liquid gases, we do not separate them. So here we have three aqueous um, solutions, that should be aqueous, I'll change that, um, and one solid, okay? So here we separated the aqueous out into their ions. Now notice you still have to have a balanced equation so you still have to put those coefficients here. And then nitrate here, you still need that two in front of it, okay, to show that I have two nitrates per one magnesium, okay? But over here, again, um, nitrate and potassium are soluble, but magnesium hydroxide is not. And so I did not separate magnesium hydroxide because it's not separated in the solution. What these net and complete ionic equations show you is that they are um, in solution, uh, floating around, whereas the solid is together in the solution, okay? Now to make the, um, or the net ionic equation, so this is called the complete ionic equation, okay? Complete ionic is all the ions, whether they're reacting or not. Net ionic is just the ions that are reacting, right? So there are these ions called spectator ions. That means you see them in the beginning of a reaction and you see them at the end. We see potassium ion at the beginning and a potassium ion at the end. We see a nitrate ion in the beginning and a nitrate ion at the end. That means that um, both of those ions did not react, right? They're not forming anything. They're called spectator ions. They're just floating around, chilling, okay? So to write the complete, or to write the net ionic equation, we just take the ions that are coming together to form um, the solid, liquid, or gas, okay? Um, so today we're gonna start with, we're just gonna review a little bit over physical and chemical changes. Um, I don't know why they put this here again, uh, but we're just going to do what they said. So again, um, chemical changes. Generally, chemical changes involve intramolecular forces, meaning inter inside, sorry, inside the molecule. So intra is those bonds, right? Intramolecular forces are bonds. Um, this includes breaking and or forming bonds between elements. So um, here's a Lewis doc diagram to show that. So notice there are bonds between O2, right? So when magnesium and oxygen come together, the double bond between O2 is going to break, and there's gonna be bonds formed between the magnesium and oxygen. Now, here it's not actually gonna be a double bond, right? Because the magnesium oxide is an ionic compound. It's those um, attraction of ions, but it's just to show you that new bonds were formed, okay? 
Whereas a physical change, um, again, it's just a change in state. It happens between the intermolecular forces, okay? So all last unit, we talked about this. We talked about intermolecular forces. We talked about boiling points, everything um, like that, the energy required to overcome. Now also think about uh, changes in within a state, so a solid. If you have a sheet of paper, if you cut it in half, it's still a sheet of paper, right? That's a physical change, okay? Whereas if you burn the piece of paper, that is a chemical change. You can't get that piece of paper back once you burn it, right? So, all right, stoichiometry. So we kind of looked at this at the beginning of the school, uh, school year. We're gonna look at it again, which is good. Um, it helps us review, but again, the um, questions from this unit is not necessarily, not necessarily. Now, there are gonna be questions that are straight up conversion, but it's also more of molar ratio questions. Okay, a mole to mole ratio of, okay, if this many moles reacted, um, what would my molar ratio look like? Or something in, along those lines. Okay, so you kind of have to think outside the box with these. So, the, um, stoichiometry is a study of numerical relationship between chemical quantities and a chemical reaction. Okay. Um, the coefficients in a chemical reaction specify the relative amounts in moles of each of the substances involved in the reaction. Okay. So, remember, I think that's what the video was ta talking about. He talked about molar ratios. Um, so, um, in order for this reaction to occur, we have to have it in ratios, okay? In order to build a bologna sandwich, okay, a cheese and bologna sandwich, we have to have two pieces of bread, one piece of cheese, one piece of bologna, right? If I only have one piece of bread, I'm not going to form a full sandwich. And that's the same here. We have to have um, two molecules of CH, um, C8H18, to, sorry, two moles, it could be molecules too, um, to 25 moles of O2 in order for this reaction to occur, okay, to occur fully. Um, so two molecules of CH18 or two moles, they're interchangeable, okay, remember that's the beauty of the mole, it can bring a molecule up to um, a level that we can manipulate. So these are our ratios, okay. Some of the questions may ask, well, if I have six moles of CH, CH18, how many moles of CO2 am I going to form? That's where you do that mole to mole. Um, conversion. Okay. Now, stoichiometric conversions, conversions that use a balanced equation to predict the amount of reactants products that will be used made from the original reactant or product. Um, so the ratio coefficients acts as a conversion factor between the amount in moles of the reactants and products. So again, I've used that, um, the illustration before of s'mores, right? When you're making a s'more, you have two pieces of graham crackers to one marshmallow to three pieces of chocolate, okay? Um, if you have so many graham crackers, you'll ask yourself, how many pieces of chocolate do I need, right? Or if you have so many marshmallows, you can ask yourself, how many um, s'mores can I make with that? Okay, so it can go, you can actually do ratios between reactants or between products, or you can do re ratios between a reactant and a product, okay? How many um, chocolate do I need with this many graham crackers? Or um, how many s'mores can I make with this many marshmallows? Okay. So the ratio acts a conversion factor between them. I mean, it kind of helps us see that this much of this, how much of this am I going to get? All right, mass to mass conversions. This is mostly what we use in the lab because we work in mass in the lab, right? Mass to mass conversions go through a mole to mole ratio in a balanced equation. So if we start off with a mass of A, we, we, we want to know how much mass B do we have. We can do mass of A and convert it to moles of A. What do I use to convert mass to moles? Molar. molar mass, okay? And then amount or in moles of A to um, moles of B, I use what? Molar molar ratio and then moles of B to mass of B, which I also use the molar mass of B, okay? Um, and so, we use, again, we use those coefficients from the balanced equation. That's our mole to mole ratio is those coefficients. Sometimes they'll give you a balanced equation. Sometimes they'll just tell you these two things are reacting. How much do I have left of this product? You have to write out that balanced equation. Okay, and that's why I told y'all um, before Christmas to make sure you're studying those um, net ionic equations and also studying how to predict reactions. Okay. Um, all right, so let's look at this. During photosynthesis, plants convert carbon dioxide and water into glucose according to the reaction. 
Suppose that a particular plant consumes 37.8 grams of CO2 in one week. Assuming that there is more energy or more than enough water present to react with all of the CO2, what mass of glucose in grams can the plant synthesize from CO2? Okay? So first, again, always underline those numbers that are given. Will you always use every single number? No. No. In this case, um, you will. But in other cases, there's an example in the homework. You're not even needing to have the question. Okay? It's just one of those that give you a whole bunch of information you don't really need. And so that's also what they're testing you at AP exam. They're not testing you about just rote um, equation writing, right? They're testing you if you're able to actually discern what you need and what you don't. Okay? So um, we have 37.8 grams of CO2. And so what is it asking? It's asking us what mass of glucose is produced in grams um, when 37.8 grams of CO2 is synthesized, okay? So we're starting off with 37.8 grams of CO2, okay? Now, first step, I need to do what? Convert to moles using what? The molar mass, okay? So the molar mass of CO2, where do I find molar mass? On the periodic table. Periodic table. It's always good to review over the basics because I can tell you what. It's probably where it's going to get you. All right, so I get 44.01 grams of CO2 and one mole of CO2. Okay, that's what, how much one mole of CO2 weighs, right? That's what that means. Okay, and again, I got that from periodic table. I took one carbon plus two oxygens, and that's what I got. Okay? Now, I, this gets me to moles of CO2, but I need grams of glucose. So how, what's my next step here? You have to get the molar ratio from the molar ratio from the equation. balanced equation, right? And so um, I see here that I have six moles of CO2. So if I have six moles of CO2, I will produce one mole of glucose. Okay? And so um, I can use that as a conversion factor. So six moles of CO2 will help me produce one mole of glucose. C6H12O6. Now, that got me to moles of glucose, but I need mass of glucose. Okay, because again, that's how we uh, manipulate the math. Lab, we use mass. So, um, what do I use next? The molar, the molar mass. Yeah. yeah. So, we do 12.01 times um, 6 plus 1.01 uh, times 12 plus 16, well, make sure I put it in right, 16 times 6, and that gives me 180.18 grams. That is how many grams of glucose is in one mole of glucose. And remember, I, I'm not very good at doing this. Um, and I probably should be grading harder on it, but you want to show every single unit in your conversions, okay? More information you give, especially on free response, the more stuff they have um, to grade, therefore, um, the less likely you're gonna get points taken off. If you just put one answer, they can't see your thought process, how you got that answer. Yeah? Oh, that's right, sorry. Um, let's have my eraser work today. My eraser did not work yesterday. <laughs> um, there we go. Yay. Okay. Sorry, Graham should be on top. I was getting ahead of myself. Oh, uh, now it's not working again. Okay, so that was one. Oh, there we go. Okay. 180.18. 180.18 grams should be on top. One more. Yeah, because you got to follow the units, right? I did not follow my units. So I was thinking ahead. So, um, yeah, you want to show your. Um, I don't know where this one. You want to show your work, every single part of your work. Yes. Do we have to do the thing where you keep the same things consistent? Like you 
Um, with your, remember, my answer needs to be in three sigma phase. Because remember with conversion factors, um, it depends on the, the table that you use. Because this periodic table is going to have different numbers for the mass than the periodic table you're given. I would still, see that's the tricky question because I've looked it up and they say, okay, they do take into account conversion factors some years and some years they don't. I would say, I would say go with your given. Because a lot of times they'll give you something, even if it's 100, they'll do 100 point because they want you to know that that's three sig figs. Does that make sense? So don't worry about sig figs when it comes to conversion factors, meaning the molar masses. And you also don't want to round until you get your right. final Right, right. Um, I did here. Well, I didn't really do it here because um, I didn't round the, I rounded the masses from this periodic table, but I think the one that he used only has three. Um, so, uh, but in this case, I'm only given one number in the question, and that has three sig figs, so my answer's going to have three. Okay. Uh, and so that's going to give me, let's, let's calculate. Okay, so three sig figs, I get 25. 0.8 grams of C6 H12O6. Okay. So that's how many grams of glucose I produced, my plant produced in a week. It's not a lot, but it's probably a tiny plant. So, yeah. All right. Any questions about that? Fairly easy. This goes back to last year. Okay. Now, um, next one. Sulfuric acid is a component of acid rain that forms when SO2 with gluten reacts with oxygen and water according to the simplified reaction. So this is a simplified reaction. Um, later on, we get to do the lovely thing of separating reactions into different stages, but we don't have to worry right now. The general, although there is a question, I meant to say this, there is a question on your homework where the reactions are, set, are separated into different stages. You have not seen that yet, but the question only asks about one of those stages. So don't let that freak you out. Um, you're gonna see that later when we're talking about kinetics. Um, because one stage may be faster than the other. Um, but that is only your homework. But again, it's only asking about, I think, the second stage. So, um, so a generation of electricity is used by a medium-sized home produces about 25 kilograms of sulfur dioxide per year. Assuming there is more than enough O2 and H2O, what mass of sulfuric acid in kilograms can be formed from this much SO2? Okay, now we're given the amount 25 kilograms of SO2 per year, and we're asked how many kilograms, what mass of um, eight sulfuric acid in kilograms can be produced. Okay, first thing I want to do is convert kilograms to grams because our molar mass is in grams. Okay, so 25 kilograms, um, to convert kilograms to grams, what do we do? Multiply by a thousand. Okay, there's a thousand grams per one kilogram. Okay, this is also a conversion factor. So it's a little easier to see it that way. So 25 times a thousand. Were y'all ever taught the metric conversion? Yes, but not like at school. Yeah, I think some teachers taught it in middle school and some didn't. And it just yeah. See, I just remember when I was, I think it was like eighth grade, we spent like a whole unit on metric conversion. Which honestly, metrics is so much easier to use anyway. Um, I use it in, when I'm cooking. When I'm baking, I measure mine in grams instead of cups and stuff. All right, so um, 25,000 grams, and this is of SO2, sulfur dioxide. Now, we're asking how much in kilograms of um, sulfuric acid is produced. So we're going to start with our 25,000 grams. And again, this is going to look like last ones, except there may be another step, SO2, okay? Now, our next conversion is going to be what? Your molar. molar mass of SO2, right? And this time I am going to make sure I get all the numbers from there. Four times two. That way we can be as accurate. So, there are 64.06 four 
eight grams of SO2 and one mole of SO2, okay? So that gives us, that converts us from grams of SO2 to moles of SO2. Now our next conversion has to be from what? Your equation. From your equation. So it has to be that mole to mole ratio. Now what are we, we're going from sulfur dioxide, right? What are we going to? Sulfuric acid, okay? That's what it's asking. Sometimes you'll have more than one reactant, or more than one product, right? You don't have to go to all of them. You just go to whatever it's asking, okay? So we have two moles of SO2 to two moles of H2SO4, okay? That is a one-to-one -one conversion, right? Even though it's two-to-two, -two, it's still considered one-to-one. One-to-one -one conversions are easy to kind of point out, okay? And a lot of the questions um, on your homework especially kind of ask you about that ratio. That, is it one-to-one? -one? Is it one-to-two? Is it one-to-three? Um, and so you, that's something you want to kind of think about in the back of your mind, thinking about what those ratios actually mean. That means if I have two moles of um, sulfuric acid, or if I have two moles of sulfur dioxide, I can produce two moles of sulfuric acid. Okay, which also means that if I have, um, no, that's, that's not a good comparison, never mind. All right, so next we go from moles to grams of sulfuric acid, right? Because we're trying to find kilograms, but we got to go to grams first. So one mole, putting this on the bottom before I um, calculate. Okay, so I'm going to do 2079. Okay, that gives me 98.07948 grams of sulfuric acid. Okay, is that what y'all got? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now, that's not my last step like it was. Why? Well, you, have to convert to kilograms. you have to convert it to kilograms, right? It's asking for us in kilograms. Now, in this case, we're going from grams to kilograms, and so we're going to divide by 1,000. And also, we can see that, that there's grams up here, so my 1,000 grams should go on the bottom. And there's 1,000 grams in one kilogram. Okay. So, let's calculate. So that gave me 38.2, our original um, number had two sig figs, right? Mm -hmm. So it should just be 38, okay? That's 38 kilograms of sulfuric acid. That's a lot of sulfuric acid, huh? <laughs> that's what acid rain comes from. That's why your um, statues are deteriorating, okay? All right, let's move on. All right, limiting reactant and excess reactants, okay? Limiting reactant. Now, you, you're not always going to have excess of one and then a little bit of another, right? Sometimes you're sitting in the lab, you got 25 grams of each. So you're going you're gonna to want to know how much product can I produce if I have 25 grams of each reactant. So limiting reactant for reactions with multiple reactants, it's likely that one of the reactants will be completely used before the others. When this reaction is used up, the reaction stops and no more product is made. The reactant limits the amount of product. Um, that's why it's called the limiting reactant, sometimes called the limiting reagent. You'll see it both ways. Um, the limiting reactant gets completely consumed. So if I have um, 10 graham crackers, uh, 5 marshmallows, well, no. If I have 10 graham crackers, 7 marshmallows, and then an unlimited amount of chocolate. Okay, that means that my limiting reactant here with 10 graham crackers, I can make five s'mores, right? With seven marshmallows, I can make seven s'mores. Don't, worry, have to, don't have to worry about the chocolate, I got enough chocolate. But how many s'mores can I actually make? Five, 
because that's only, no matter how many marshmallows I got, if I only got 10 graham crackers, I can only make five s'mores. So the graham crackers are the limiting reactant. It limits how much s'mores I can make. So think of it that way. That's the same in chemistry. Um, doesn't matter how much of one reactant I have, if I only have a little bit amount of the other, I can only make so much product, okay? Now reactants not completely consumed are called excess reactants. So in that case, marshmallow and chocolate are the excess reactants. I'm gonna have stuff left over. Um, so the amount of product that can be made from the limiting reactant is called the theoretical yield. So theoretically, I can make this much. Now, that doesn't really happen in real life, right? Unless you're in a very um, confined, very clean lab setting, um, your um, theoretical yield and your actual yield are not going to be the same. You're actually going to yield less than what you theoretically could. Because theoretical yield tells me that every single molecule within my compounds reacted, which in, we know that doesn't really necessarily happen. I mean, it all boils down to even just pressure. Um, there's all these different um, quotients that you have to talk about. Reactant quotient, all that. So, the limiting reactant or limiting reagent is the reactant that is completely consumed. The reactant excess is, um, occurs a quantity greater than required. So, let's look at this. So, theoretical yield, again, is the amount of product that can be made in chemical re reaction based on the amount of limiting reactant. But the actual yield is the product that's actually produced. So, the actual yield, this, um, formula to get the percent yield is what we use in a lab to see if we did our reaction correctly. In college, you'll do a lot of these labs where it'll act, ask you, um, it'll ask you for a certain percent yield. So you'll do the reaction and you'll take your actual yield, divide by how much you theoretically could get out, and it'll give you a percent yield. And so if your percent yield is under 90%, the professor may ask you to do it again because that's assumed that you did, uh, there was too much human error for that reaction to occur. So, um, we're going to look at those. So, ammonia in H3 can be synthesized by the reaction starting with 86.3 grams of nitrogen monoxide and 25.6 grams of hydrogen. Find the theoretical yield of ammonia in grams. Okay, so we're not, we're given two amounts of each reactant, right? And it's asking us the theoretical yield of ammonia in grams. Okay, theoretical yield is, remember, how much I can theoretically produce. Okay, so I'm starting with actually two, 86.3 grams of NO, and then 25.6 grams of H2. Now, just looking at these amounts, can I, can I pick out which one's going to run out first? No, okay. We don't have them in moles. Um, we, you can kind of do it, if it's in moles, you can kind of do it with molar ratio. Um, but we have them in grams, so it's really hard to um, discern that because remember, nitrogen monoxide is going to weigh different than H2. So it may look like I have a lot more nitrogen monoxide than H2, but I actually may have less. Okay. So first step is I'm going to convert it. Okay, I'm going to do two tables for this to moles of nitrogen monoxide. Okay. So um, we put our molar mass on the bottom. So let me do. ammonia can actually can I make right and so what we're doing is we're actually doing conversion from nitrogen monoxide to ammonia and from hydrogen to ammonia to see which one produces the least amount okay, think of the s'mores the least amount is your theoretical yield because no matter how much of the other reactant you have you can only produce so much product so my next conversion is going to be a mole to mole so we have two moles of NO and again, we're going to ammonia. So we don't have to worry about the water in this case. If it doesn't tell you which product you want to go, it wants to go to, because um, a lot of these, sometimes they won't tell you what product to go to. I don't foresee that happening on the AB exam, because the limiting reactant can be different depending on, maybe it won't. It won't. I don't know. Um, if it doesn't 
tell you what product to go to, you just pick one. Okay, I could, I could go to ammonia or water if it didn't tell me. This case it does. It tells me ammonia. Okay, so that's on to two moles of ammonia. Okay. And then I'm going to go convert. Um, now, the theor this question oh, tells us in grams. Yeah. So if it told us just the theoretical yield, if it didn't ask it for in grams, we can actually stop at moles. Okay. But here it's asking us for in grams, and so we got to convert to grams. going to give me 17.03056 grams of NH3. Okay. I would keep it as that on both calculations, and then when you like put your answer at the bottom round to six fix and like start bullet saying this is your answer. Um, you could round those to six fix and then just circle your answer on that. But again, I don't know. I think it's more neater just to be like this is my answer here. Yeah. Okay. Especially on these, because several questions can be asked. So you can ask the theoretical yield, or you can ask what is the limiting reactant, which is going to be it's not going to be that number. It's going to be a it's going to be either nitrogen monoxide or hydrogen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, now we're going to do okay. so 2.0158 grams of hydrogen, one mole of hydrogen. And again, we're going to ammonia again. Okay, so that's going to be Five moles of hydrogen to two moles of NH3. And one mole of NH3. And again, we can get the mass from up here. We don't have to calculate it again. 17.0356. Okay. So 25.6. Gives me eighty six point five zero nine five eight one one three grams of NH three. Okay, so if I have eighty six grams of nitrogen monoxide, I can only produce forty eight or roughly forty nine grams of ammonia. Mm -hmm. But if I have twenty five grams of hydrogen, I can produce eighty six grams of ammonia. Okay, do y'all see that conversion there? So, um, which one of these is the actual, the theoretical yield? The, 40, 48. the 48, the least amount, right? Okay, because again, think of it like uh, graham crackers and marshmallows. If I have five graham crackers, I can only make five s'mores. If I have seven marshmallows, I can make seven s'mores. But it doesn't matter how much marshmallows I have, if I only have 10 marshmallows, I can only make five s'mores, okay? So, my theoretical yield here is going to be 48, and again, it's going to be 3 sig fig. So, 48 point, actually, no, going to round up. It's going to be 49.0 grams of NH3. Okay, that is my theoretical yield. Now, what if it asked um, for the limiting reactant? What would the limiting reactant be? What would your answer be? Just 
nitrogen monoxide. Okay, so it's not asking for the amount of limiting reactant. I mean, it may. But if it's asking for the limiting reactant, it just wants a formula, nitrogen monoxide. Because nitrogen monoxide was the one that produced the least amount, right? So that is the limiting reactant. So again, think of, um, if I asked you with the s'mores, what was the limiting reactant, you would tell me graham crackers, okay? But if I asked you for the theoretical yield, you would tell me five s'mores, okay? So make sure you pay attention to what is being asked in the question. Now, let me ask you this. Say I produced, if in a lab, say I did this reaction and produced um, 46.7 grams of NH3. Okay, and then I asked for the percent yield. Okay, what I would do, this is my actual yield, right? I did this in the lab. That's what I actually yielded. This is theoretically how much, this is theoretically how much I could actually produce. Okay, so what you do to get the um, percent yield is you take the um, actual yield divided by the theoretical multiply it by 100%. And that will give you the theoretical yield. So 46.7 divided by 49.0. That would give me 93, or sorry, 95.3% yield. Okay, it's a good percent yield. Okay, so that's how you would calculate it. So if it tells you in this that it said, um, the actual amount in the lab was this, or if this is how much was produced in the lab or something like that. Um, that's talking about the actual yield. The theoretical yield comes from those calculations. Okay. Are you all done writing that? Alright. Alright, solutions and stoichiometry. So um, we can do stoichiometry with molarity, right? Okay. So when a table of salt is mixed with water, it seems to disappear or become a liquid. The mixture is homogeneous, so a lot of this is a review. Um, but homogeneous mixtures are called solutions. The majority component is solvent. The um, minority is a solute. This is coming directly from, um, I think, the beginning. A solution in which water is a solvent is an aqueous solution. Because solutions are mixtures, the composition can vary um, from one sample to another, right? So we have to use molarity um, to describe uh, the amount of moles I have in a solution. We use concentration, right? Because if I have two salt solutions, I can have a higher concentration of salt ions in one than in the other. Okay. So in the way we do that is with molarity. So remember, moles of solute over volume of solution. That is molarity. Okay. Moles over liters. Moles per liter. Okay, again, you're going to see molarity a lot, a lot, so make sure you know this. Um, we can use molarity in solutions as a conversion factor. So remember, for example, 0.5 uh, molar sodium chloride solution contains 0.5 moles of sodium chloride for every liter of solution. So we can convert, mol uh, we can convert liters of solution to moles of sodium chloride, or we can convert moles of sodium chloride to liters of solution. We can use that as a conversion factor just like we use um, molar mass. Okay. Now again, solution dilutions. Again, this is reviewing, um, but um, sometimes solutions are stored as stock solutions, and then we can dilute them to a certain molarity. And so we use that M1 V1 times equals M2 V2. Okay. And um, to dilute it, so here's a picture of that. We're starting off with 0.15 liters of a 10 molar stock solution, um, and to dilute it to three. To make it a 0.5 molar solution, we dilute it to three liters. So that's how many of our stock solution we can take um, to get the certain dilution we want. Okay. All right, what volume in liters of 0 0.150 molar potassium chloride solution will completely react with 0 0.150 liters of a 0 0.175 molar um, lead nitrate solution according to the following balance? equation okay so again think of molarity as conversion factors like molar mass so what we won't normally we won't honestly ever normally start with molarity okay that's not going to be our breaking off point 
That's a conversion vector, just like we don't normally start with molar mass, right? Here, we're given two molarities. We're given the potassium chloride molarity, and we're given the lead nitrate molarity. But we're also given the amount of lead nitrate that I have, okay, or the volume, not the amount, the volume of the um, lead nitrate that I have. So what I can do is I can use those two molarities, and it's asking um, what volume, and we're asking what volume of potassium chloride do I need? Or what volume of potassium chloride will I have if I have this much of this concentration of lead nitrate, mm -hmm. okay? So we're starting with the liters. So they are in liters, right? You wanna make sure that they're in liters because it's moles per liter, that's what molarity is. Um, it's already in liters, they made it easy for us. So 150 liters of lead nitrate. Now in this case, we're not gonna use uh, molar mass, right? We're gonna use molarity instead, the molarity of the lead nitrate. So we said that our molarity of lead nitrate is um, 0.175 molarity. That means it's 0.175 moles in one liter. Okay, that's what molarity means. So since I have liters up here, I'm going to put that one liter on the bottom. And then my 0 0.175 is going to go with my moles of lead nitrate. Okay. Now, we've gotten to moles of lead nitrate, but we want liters of potassium chloride, right? So we will still do a mole-to-mole -mole conversion here. We're going from a um, we're going from a reactant to another reactant. It's asking how much potassium chloride do I need to completely react to the lead nitrate? Okay. Um, so we're going to use our mole-to-mole -mole conversion. So one mole of lead nitrate um, to two moles of potassium chloride. Now, I still have one more conversion because it's asking for the volume in liters, right? And I can use molarity to convert moles to liters. So my molarity for the potassium chloride is 0 0.150 molarity or 0 0.150 moles per one liter, okay? So I'm gonna put 0 0.150 moles of potassium chloride on the bottom and one liter of potassium chloride on top. Let's calculate. And in this case, you do want to take all of the sig figs into account, okay? because your conversion factors were given to you. If your conversion factor is given in the question, you have to take those um, sig figs into account. But if it is not given into the, in the question, like if it's, you have to calculate the molar mass, you do not. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So here we have three, three, three. So it's really not gonna be um, hard one. I don't have to take these into account because um, it's, a mul it's a ratio and you really don't wanna Take ratios into account. So I'm going to do three, three, three. So that means my answer is going to have three six figs. So I get 0 0.350 um, liters of potassium chloride. So what that means is I actually need 350 milliliters of this um, concentration of potassium chloride to completely react with 150 milliliters of lead nitrate. Okay, that's what that means. All right, any questions about that? Again, if you can think of molarity as a conversion factor, it's fairly easy. All right, blackboard chalk. Now, this has to do with gases. So that's what I was trying to do before um, I started this lecture is because a lot of the questions I saw had to do with gases, okay? It had to do with this many moles of gas was produced, what's the pressure. Um, so when you're doing with gases, you also want to take into account um, ideal gas law, PV equals nRT. So if so many moles are produced, the pressure of that gas that is produced, we can um, use the ideal gas law to do that. 
if you're given the temperature and all that, okay? Um, just keep that in mind. Um, this one I don't think really has anything to do, no, but it's talking about gas. Um, no, it's not, it's not even talking about volume of gas, but it's not, it's talking about an SPV. Um, so this is the closest thing I could get <laughs> to a gas, even though it's technically not really a gas. Um, because gases also have, can also have concentrations too, okay? Um, but in this case, it's asking volume. So it's asking, like more chalk is almost 100% calcium carbonate, what volume of carbon dioxide will be produced at SCP if an excess of chalk is reacted with 30.5 milliliters of 0.888 molar hydrochloric acid? Okay. Um, so basically, uh, we have hydrochloric acid, we have calcium carbonate. Now, out of those two, which one's my limiting reactant? Is hydrochloric acid or calcium carbonate my limiting reactant? Hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid. Because, look, keyword, excess of chalk. We said chalk was calcium carbonate, right? Mm -hmm. So excess of chalk means I got enough chalk. What I don't have enough of is my hydrochloric acid. Okay, so that's going to be the limiting reactant. But it's asking us um, how much, what volume of carbon dioxide will be produced. Okay. Let me double check and make sure I'm going to do this. <laughs> Okay. So this one again, you got to think about um, gases. So first, we're talking. First, we're going to start with our thirty point five milliliters of HCl. Now, I want to convert this to liters, right? Mm -hmm. Because we're given molarity, um, and so that's going to be in liters. So that's going to be zero point. Is it zero three zero five? I'm going to have to do it because I'm second. Yeah, zero point, zero point. Zero three. Yeah. That's what I'm Liters of HCl. Okay. Um, so that is um, our starting point. We're, always, we're going to start with liters. Okay. Now we're going to CO2. So um, first I want to convert liters to moles, and we're going to use our molarity that was given. So 0 0.8. Eight, eight. Nope, that's not good on the bottom. What am I doing? One liter of HDL is on the bottom, and then zero point eight 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 moles of HDL is on the bottom. Okay. Now we're going to carbon dioxide, so we're going to use that mole to mole ratio. Okay. So this gives me um. So we have two moles of HDL to one mole of CO two. Okay, now you may see a problem here. We don't want moles of CO2. What do we want? Oh. Liters. Okay, so you got to think back to conversion factors. Okay, especially with gases. You all remember the conversion factor of liters to moles with gases? 22.4. 22.4. So there are 22.4 liters, um, in this case, of CO2 and one mole of CO2, right? And that's because, remember, gases, the, those molecules are so far apart. Um, that the size of the molecule is, doesn't necessarily um, matter. And again, this is at STP. That's why I was telling you it's at STP, because remember last unit, we talked about high pressure, all that kind of stuff. So, um, but in this case, it's at STP, so it doesn't matter. So we know one mole of CO2 is 22.4 liters of CO2. So I see. So um, three six six. So zero point three zero three liters of CO two. Is that what y'all got? Yes. Okay, that's not a lot. Or it can um, be. It's asking it for liter in liters, right? No, it's just asking volume. Or it can be um, three hundred three milliliters of CO two. So I'm guessing they'll take both because it didn't specify what unit it wanted. Then. 
Okay, any questions about that one? Now remember, these are. I'm just going over these calculations, okay? You have to be able to take these calculations and use the, what this calculation is telling you to answer questions, okay? So again, like I asked you, um, especially limiting reactants is a good example of that. Um, with the, uh, like something like this, like it'll tell you this is the actual yield, what's the percent um, yield. You're not really, you don't really see the straightaway conversion from what you're given to your answer, right? You have to go through several different, you have to go through two conversions to see what um, is my actual yield, that's the lowest yield, and then I have to take my um, actual yield divided by, um, by my, sorry, I have to take my actual yield divided by my theoretical yield to get my percent yield, okay? Um, so a lot of times in these questions, the answer is not actually apparent, but when in doubt, do a conversion, okay? Um, even doing the conversion, if, you, if you're saying, okay, what units is it really asking for? What did I start with? Even doing the conversion, you can actually kind of figure it out and see it. Um, and so that's what they're actually, they're gonna be asking you, not necessarily rote um, re, uh, answers, like rote numerical answers, but they may be asking you about ratios. Okay, so what does this ratio mean? That means if I have two moles of ammonium, um, or if I produce two moles of ammonium, that means I used five moles of hydrogen. Okay, so they're not, they may not necessarily ask you for a straight up answer. So with stoichiometry, you have to understand what is actually occurring. What am I doing here? I'm converting grams to moles because I need to use that for a mole to mole ratio. Okay, um, so again, it's what AP Chem is, it's application, that's all it is. It's taking what we know about conversions and applying it to real life. Okay, so now um, what you'll do is there's a uh, unit uh, four, practice two, on campus.